Hello, this is Joseph Holbrook, Latin American History, and this week we're talking about nationalism in Latin America. This is the time period from a little bit after 1910 with the beginning of the Mexican Revolution through 1945. So we're drawing this from John Chastain's book, Born in Blood and Fire, Chapter 6. Here's a famous mural of Frida Kahlo, the wife of uh, Diego Rivera, handing out rifles. So, let's get started. Um, in this period of time, we have Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina will be our case studies. Uh, each of them experienced neocolonialism up to about 1930. Uh, in the case of Mexico with Porfirio Diaz and Brazil, uh, Brazil is Brazil's first republic. And in Argentina, uh, you had Buenos Aires and you had uh, the rise of the populist class. And then nationalism began around 1910 in Argentina. That was the radical party was driven by the ballot box that displaced the landowning oligarchy but remained mired in traditional patronage politics. In Brazil, you had Getulio Vargas during this period of time, uh, who uh, was an authoritarian. And in Mexico, you had the Mexican Revolution, and then you had the presidency of Lázaro Cárdenas. So, national identity. For United... For a nation to be united internally, they have to know who they are. They have to need clear and positive sense of national identity. For centuries of Latin American transculturation, the creative process of cultural give and take had given rise to a multitude of differences in speech and customs and attitudes intertwined with the process of transculturation, the process also of race mixing had created national populations that were distinctive. This brings us to American nativism. During the colonial period, European rulers had assigned American difference a negative meaning, essentially a political act uh, to be an Americano. Then independence minded Creoles reversed that attitude in their nativist rhetoric in 1810 to 25. Americanos, you are the true sons of the soil, was the saying. Again, as a power move, as a matter of politics. In the 1900s, there was another wave of the earlier nativist spirit, now with a strong economic agenda. A, an example of this nativism or Mulatto nationalism was Nicholas Guillen. He celebrated two of his grandfathers, the slave and the conquistador, in his poem, The Ballad of the Two Grandfathers, in 1935. Let me see if I can find the picture here. Well, this is... Uh, Nicholas Guillen, with his bone-tipped lance, his wooden drum, and rawhide head, my black grandfather with his ruffled collar, his gray and warlike armor, my white grandfather. That's the beginning of his poem, My Two Grandfathers. And this is a picture of a white whitening. It's a famous uh, Brazilian painting called The Redemption of Ham. In 1895, you see the kind of the white Portuguese father smiling a bit smugly. And uh, he's there with his uh, mulatto wife. And her mother, who's a black African slave, or was a slave, was standing there. And then the baby in her lap is pretty much white. And the African grandmothers giving thanks to God for this process of whitening. 
So um, the rejection of Eurocentric aesthetics, metaphors of race mixing provided a positive myth of descent for Cuba as a mestizo or mulatto nation. Guillen's poetry had a musicality to it that was intended to echo percussive African rhythms, and some poems phonetically imitated black Cuban speech. These choices signaled a profound rejection of the Eurocentric aesthetic, typical of earlier periods of Latin American history. Guillen became the most acclaimed exponent of Afro-Cuban poetry. There are some other examples of mestizo or mulatto nationalism in Latin America during this period. They were in the French Caribbean, there was a Negritude movement. Uh, also, there were contemporary novelists. Cuba had Alejo Carpentier. Peru had Ciro Alegria. And Guatemala had Miguel Angel Asturias, who also used African and indigenous themes in their art. During this period of time, there was also an attempt at national reconciliation through love, through romance. Uh, not only did these nationalist authors deny the premise of the European racial superiority, uh, but they raised the idea of race mixing to a special position of patriotic honor. They did so even as Hitler's Nazis were successfully promoting the doctrine of white supremacy. Uh, some examples of some uh, national epics during this period which attempted to, uh, which basically were nativist or attempted to celebrate mestizo identity was Jose de Alencar's book, Iracema, in 1865 in Brazil, C Cirillo Villaverde in Cecilia Valdez, 1882 in Cuba, Mariano Asuelo, The Underdogs, in 1915 in Mexico, and Romulo Gallegos and Doña Barbara, written in 1929 in Venezuela. These were national romances that attempted to portray the, the metaphor of a national reconciliation through love and through romance. In the case of Cirilo Verde, for, for example, Cecilia Valdez, a mulatto woman, is seduced by a white landowner's son. And, of course, in most of these cases, the ending is tragic as opposed to a successful reconciliation. Uh, there's other examples in art as well. Here is the Brown Pride, the coffee grower, by the internationally recognized Brazilian painter Candido Potinari, is a confident and powerful figure in no need of whitening. Like many nationalists, Potinari artistically celebrated the dignity of the working class. And Jose Vasconcelos, a Mexican minister of education during the 1920s, invented the term La Raza Cosmica, the triumph of what he called the La Raza Cosmica or the cosmic race, meaning mestizos, the, a, a nationality based on mixture. Then there was the uh, muralism of Diego Rivera. Here's a couple of his murals depicting two partial views uh, these are views of Mexican history. And uh, this is Diego Rivera, an artist shortly after the Mexican Revolution. Then there was Frida Kahlo, who demonstrated her nationalism by insisting on dressing in the traditional Mexican styles, even while in New York City. Her necklace of thorns is just a single strand, but it draws even more blood. In the background, leafless broken off wings profiled against, uh, profiled against a opalescent sky. Hold on, I lost my place here. Looks like dead twigs woven into Frida's necklace. In a self-portrait with a honey hummingbird. No doubt that the dry white buds that mingle with the twigs and that drew from Frida's headdress likely also refer to her desolation. So this is nationalism in the arts, reflected in Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo in Mexico. Everything national had become fashionable. Folk music uh, 
uh, express through corridos in Mexico and dance, jarabes, traditional dishes, tamales and moles, old-style street theater, carpas, and artisan objects like Frida's paper mache skeletons. Mexican movies featured musically macho charros like Jorge Negrete, the, a Mexican version of the U.S. singing cowboy, now competed with Hollywood. The nationalism of many Mexican revolutionaries had Marxist overtones. Also, there was nationalism in Peru. I spoke last week about Victor Raúl Aya de la Torre, who was led the Peruvian nationalists mostly from exile. He was first exiled from Peru in 1920 for leading student protests against Peru's pro-U.S. dictator. In Mexico, whose revolution was strongly impressed him, the young radical intellectual founded an international party, the Popular American Revolutionary Alliance, or APRA, as a kind of collective self-defense against economic imperialism in Latin America. Also in Peru, you had a, uh, a uh, thinker and philosopher named Jose Carlos Mariategui, who imagined an indigenous socialism combining Inca models with Marxist theory. But Peru, com when compared to Mexico, remained more ethnically split. The highlands were heavily indigenous, and the coast was more black and white. Consequently, indigenismo was less successful as a unifying force in Peru, since it was so uh, divided. Here's a, uh, another example of art, indigenismo and in art. This is the Indian mayor of Chincheros, drawn by, painted in 1925 by Jose Savogal. Uh, he was Peru's in principal and indigenista painter. Shows a community leader holding a staff of office in an idealization of the traditional indigenous life. And then uh, we also spoke about Lázaro Cárdenas last year, last week, the uh, populist president of Mexico from 1934 to 1940. Unlike FDR, Cárdenas came from humble beginnings. During his six years in office, he distributed almost 45 million acres of land, twice as much as the previous 24 years put together. He gave his support to labor organizations and, unlike Vargas, defended their right to strike. He also uh, nationalized the oil re resources of Mexico, which greatly angered the United States, oil companies in the United States. Uh, this was also the period of the end of gunboat diplomacy. President Wilson had landed troops in Mexico in 1914, in Haiti in 1915, in the Dominican Republic in 1916, in Mexico a second time in 1916, and in Mexico several additional times before Wilson left office. Wilson, uh, a great liberal and also a racist, a, a thoroughgoing racist, as well as a uh, interventionist in Latin America. He uh, also uh, intervened in Cuba in 1917 and in Panama in 1918. Also, for most of the Wilson administration, the U.S. military occupied Nicaragua, installed a Nicaraguan president that the U.S. preferred and ensured the company signed treaties favorable to the U.S. When FDR was elected president in 1933, he announced an end to the gumboat diplomacy and called his approach the good neighbor policy which at least was a bit of an improvement. A good neighbor policy. Here's a picture of FDR with Getulio Vargas of Brazil. Uh, good neighbors. Brazil collaborated with the United States in World War II. Uh, ISI was a import substitution industrialization economic model known as ISI, 
In the 1930s, uh, as the 30s progressed through the Great Depression, an important phenomenon occurred, a positive side effect of the collapse of international trade. With the onset of the Great Depression, the export economy of neocolonialism collapsed. This led many Latin Americans to try to shift their priorities to developing their own industrial capacity called import substitution industrialization. So the idea was by having heavy tariffs and giving a competitive edge to your local or domestic industries, they could produce things competitively that were being produced in other countries. Heavy industry involves producing durable goods like cars, radios, and refrigerators. Heavy industry required equipment that simply had to be imported. In other words, precise uh, equipment for manufacturing. And it required steel. A national steel industry meant joining the big leagues. Only Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, and Chile had steel industries in the 1940s. Smaller countries like Nicaragua and Honduras were unable to implement ISI because they had no steel production. That left them dependent on ex growing and exporting bananas and at the mercy of the uh, United Fruit Company. Here's a picture of Getulio Vargas, the leader of Brazil between 1930 and 1945. He ruled Brazil as a revolutionary for, at first, then as a constitutional president, and finally as a dictator. In 1951, he was elected for a final term, which ended with his suicide. Oddly enough. Another interesting character during this period of time was Carmen Miranda. You'll see her in some Hollywood films during this time. She was a Brazilian actress and dancer that rode the new nationalist samba music to stardom. When she went viral in the United States as an exotic symbol of South American and Brazilianness, she developed an exaggerated customs emphasizing fruits. This was not, Brazilians didn't go around wearing these hats, in other words. This was for consumption in the United States. And uh, there's a couple links that you can look up on YouTube Chicka Chicka Boom Chick and Donald Duck and Zay Carioca. I'll play those in class rather than here today. So this uh, pretty much brings us to the end of our chapter. I just mentioned one more thing, and that is mulatto nationalism or mestizo nationalism was a tr sweeping transformation of public culture. Uh, suge it suggested that Latin America's bitter legacy of racial hierarchy and political exclusion was fast disintegrating. The hallways of Mexican's palace of Mexico's palace of government, and now proudly displayed Diego Rivera's huge murals depicting the achievements of indigenous Mexico and the evils of Spanish colonization. The black samba dancers of Rio de Janeiro now acclaimed as exponents of Brazilian national culture and their carnival parades received state subsidies. Across the board, Latin Americans were taking pride in themselves and in each other. So um, on page 260, there is a list of key terms of vocabulary that you should be familiar with. I don't know if I mentioned Rafael Trujillo. He was the dictator of the Dominican Republic. And uh, Pancho Villa, that's another story we need to tell. I'll go into that later. Um, so there's, please take a look at these and make sure you're familiar with these terms. And here are the study questions. Uh, so some questions about nation, nationalist politics engaging broad enthusiasm in Latin America after 1929, which shows the beginning of the nationalist period in Latin America. What was the new nationalist ideology of race? How was it embodied in the arts? Be prepared to talk about what is import substitution and industrialization. Why did nationalists often appear as revolutionaries? Was the nationalist movements right or left? We could say the same thing about the populist. Okay, that's all I got for today. I'll see you next week.